Okay, so I'll get started and describe uh, some of our work with mouse models for COVID-19 and then talk a little bit about coronavirus immune responses. Sounds great, thank you. I'll okay. give you a, a reminder at 23 minutes. Okay, great. So no conflicts of interest. And so what I'm going to briefly describe is some mouse models of uh, COVID-19 infection, some approaches and some of the things that are being done and some things we have done. So mice are naturally resistant to SARS-CoV-2 because of actually fairly minor incompatibility between the surface spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 and the mouse ACE2, which is the receptor for the virus. And so there have been several approaches to make mice susceptible to the infection. Uh, one is to Mod one general approach is to modify mice so that they express uh, human ACE2. And uh, this can be done either by providing human ACE2 exogenously by transduction via an adenovirus a 5 vector, which we described before for MERS. And then the second way is to make human ACE2 transgenic mice. And the third is to make human ACE2 knock in mice. And I'll describe these briefly. And as I mentioned already, both approaches really. Uh, require just very few amino acid changes in either the ACE2 receptor or in the virus that itself, which makes it so it can now bind to ACE2. And so I'm going to spend a lot, most of my time on the adenovirus human ACE2 sensitization system because we actually uh, work with this mostly over the last month while we uh, were getting the other systems up and running. So the way this works is you can take any mouse and sensitize it by transduction with, uh, with uh, adenovirus 5 expressing human ACE2. And after five days, we then infect mice with 10 to the fifth SARS-CoV-2. And these adenovirus H human ACE2 constructs are available from BEI or will be available very shortly. I think they're available this week, but I'm not sure. So this shows some of the results we've seen. The first is on the left-hand panel, uh, is a Western blot showing that adeno 5 ACE2 really expresses ACE2. That's, and we have a C9 tag at the end of the construct, so that's another way to detect it. By flow cytometry, uh, you can see that there's expression of ACE2. And then uh, if you look at transduction of tissue culture cells, these are mouse tissue culture cells, uh, transduction with adenovirus 5 ACE2 sensitizes them to high levels of infection with the virus. And then finally, if you look at infected lungs, uh, which was the next thing we did, you can see that there's high amounts of ACE2 uh, as shown by the brown staining on the left right-hand side. The upper one shows a low power and the right-hand side shows a high power image showing that ACE2 is expressed in many different cells and at abundant levels. And basically anywhere that ADNO5 can transduce, uh, you get very good expression of ACE2. And then if you, so we then infected mice, this in this case, BALP-C mice uh, with the virus. And after infection, um, you can see that uh, if you infect mice after transduction with adeno 5 expressing, not, not expressing ACE2, that there's no change in weight. But if they express ACE2, there's a, up to almost a 20% weight loss in weight. And this is what we saw with MERS as well, that because we're not too exactly sure why the, the, it's transient, because uh, I don't think the ACE2 goes away that quickly. But this is what we generally see is that this weight loss at days four to six or so, and then uh, weight gain for the most part. And then looking at virus titers on the right-hand side, virus titers are maximal right after uh, infection, and then they uh, decrease with time. And in the absence of the ACE2 receptor, there's no virus titers that we can detect. And then looking in the lungs, uh, the virus antigen is found, shown on the left-hand side. You can see adenovirus 5 empty. There's no virus antigen. And in the lower panel, you can see that uh, looking, this is an antibody to the N protein that we obtained from John Nichols at the University of Hong Kong. And there's nice staining showing virus antigen at uh, many of the places that ACE2 is expressed. In fact, most of them. And then if you look at histology, and here we have both BALP-C and B6 mice, uh, looking especially at the lower panels, it's really clear that there's extracellular infiltrates. Uh, some, there's actually some hemorrhage, so it's hard to see. And there's edema uh, that's shown here in uh, these mice. But they're really not that sick, even with all that going on. They've had 20% weight loss, and they certainly recover. And when we quantitated this, we saw that there was increased necrotic cell debris uh, in the BALP-C mice at early times at day two. And 
we saw mononuclear cell infiltration in both the BALP-C and the B6 mice at day five post-infection. Then we wanted to see what other, uh, to see uh, what else is required for clearance of, of SARS-CoV-2, and we did some very simple measurements. Uh, one is we took mice that were lacking interferon signaling, that's the blue line shown in the left upper panel, and these mice also lost weight but then regained it. So it didn't, in terms of weight, the interferon didn't matter. In fact, if anything, mice were a little better uh, without interferon, they recovered a little more quickly. And this is consistent with what we've seen previously that even though in, while interferon is protective in many cases may also contribute to, to some pathogenicity. I think the most interesting panel here, interferon gamma shows no effects, but if you look at the weight loss of stat one knockouts, there is a substantial weight loss that continues to day eight and then slowly is recovering uh, by the time the experiment terminated. These mice didn't die, but this is consistent with results from SARS-CoV where uh, uh, Matt Fryman and Ralph Barrick showed that STAT1 was really important for clearance in B6 mice. These young B6 mice for SARS-CoV were completely resistant to the infection and only STAT1 knockout was the only time that they ever actually got sick. You could knock out interference signaling and various other uh, interventions that we did and Ralph's lab did and showed that it didn't really matter for uh, clinical outcomes. And the next panel shows virus titers in these animals. And if you look again at the purple line, which is the, uh, in, the stat one knockout or the interferon knockout, you can see virus clearance is delayed in both of those, though clearance, see, whoops, clearance seems to be a little more rapid in the uh, stat one knockouts. And then looking at the histology, there's a much greater cellular infiltrate in the stat one knockout mice. And then looking in the bottom panel, we wanted to test one intervention, in this case, poly IC. And if you, if mice are treated with poly IC, they uh, don't lose weight appreciably. And the virus is cleared a little more quickly at day two. We would have expected a little more clearance at day five. So I'm not sure why this is delayed. Uh, it was not more rapid than it was, but at least it's an effect at day two post-infection. And then we also uh, wanted to look at T cell responses in these mice. And what the panels basically show here is that the red is the uh, controls. And if you don't have either CD4 uh, here or CD8 cells or CD4 and CD8, then virus clearance is delayed, though it eventually catches up. And then, uh, so showing that the T cell response is required for virus clearance. And then if you look at uh, the T, what do the T cells recognize in these mice? For the CD4 T cells, the, the predominant target is a nucleocapsid protein, though other uh, proteins are also recognized. Uh, this may not be over background, so probably this is the only one that looks real. And then for the uh, CD8 T cell response in BALPC mice, it's mostly directed at the uh, S1 segment of the uh, S protein. And this is the time course in uh, BALPC mice of both. This is the uh, percentage of CD4 T cells and then the numbers, which peak at about day eight and come down, which is what you see in the natural infection as well. And CD8 T cells, the same thing, peak at about day eight and then come down. And then to do two, two other interventions here, uh, we, uh, we, we use, or one other intervention, we use a VRPS, which is a Venezuelan replicant particle. We immunize mice with this about three weeks before infection, before adenovirus transduction and infection. And what happens is if you immunize the mice basically with VRPS, there's a decrease in virus loads. And this is true in either BALP-C mice, that's the red bars, or B6 mice, again, the red bars showing that viruses, uh, amount of virus greatly decreases in the presence of immunization. In the left panel, well, this, this answers the question, this asks the question, does this transduction system induce an antibody response? And the titers are not very high, but anti uh, neutralizing antibody titers are detected at day 10 after transduction, or after infection rather than not transduction. And they, they seem to diminish a bit by day 15. I'm not sure why they've gone down. This may not be uh, statistically significant or biologically significant. And then getting back to the VRPS immunization, uh, what we show here is that it's actually the antibodies that are protective, or at least some of the protection. If we take sera from the VRPS immunized mice and transfer them to mice before uh, sensitization with adenovirus and challenge with uh, the virus, uh, virus titers are decreased in the presence of uh, serum from BRPS immunized animals, but not from BRPN 
M or E immunized animals, you can see that these are identical to controls. So not surprisingly, the antibody that's protective is against the surface glycoprotein because it's neutralizing. And then these are two other therapies that we, uh, we examined here. Again, some of this isn't surprising, but uh, we wanted to prove the, this is proof of principle for the system. So we transferred a healthy donor plasma. And when we did that from COVID-19 patients and not from MERS patients or SARS patients, MERS is green, SARS is blue, and COVID-19 is red in the second panel over, virus titers decrease when the presence of convalescent sera from um, COVID-19 patients, but not from the other two groups. And when you look at the histology in these animals, uh, that's shown in panel B, the, uh, the COVID-19 sera uh, basically protected mice from the, the pathological changes that we saw in the control samples. And that the control samples are either, in this case, the healthy donor or the MERS or the SARS or all have more cellular infiltration. And then finally, uh, we tested the effects of remdesivir which is a, a, a compound that uh, potently inhibits uh, virus replication by inhibiting polymerase function. And in this case, remdesivir, uh, mice treated with remdesivir recover much more quickly. That's shown in the uh, panel C, the, le or, yes, the left hand panel. And virus is cleared much more quickly, which is to be expected from remdesivir. So, and remdesivir really works well when it's given early during the infection. And then in D, it shows the histological changes or lack thereof after remdesivir therapy. Okay, so that's most of what I want to say about the adenovirus system. Then I just want to briefly mention the other systems that are available. So you have the K18 uh, human ACE2 mice, which, uh, in which K K18 is an epithelial cell promoter. Um, and what we knew in the past is that K18 ACE2 mice and K18 DPP4 mice developed encephalitis after infection with SARS-CoV or MERS-CoV respectively. And one, this is one curiosity for the aficionados, is that when we, so to, we ended up mouse adapting MERS-CoV to, uh, for other systems that to, for them to become lethal or more, cause more severe disease in mice in which the human receptor for the MERS virus was knocked in as opposed to being given transgenically. And what's really curious is that this mouse adapted virus no longer caused encephalitis in the K18, uh, DPP4 mice. So there's something, even though there was very few changes, only six changes in the, uh, in the sequence and only one was in the S protein, it seemed to somehow make it so that this virus is no longer able to track up through the olfactory system and infect the brain. Uh, the, the K18 uh, human ACE2 mice are now being distributed from Jackson Laboratory as of this month. And so far, our preliminary results from uh, our group and others said uh, the, K, the K18 ACE2 mice are probably going to develop encephalitis, at just like the, ACE, the uh, SARS-CoV infection did. Uh, this is still really preliminary, so we're not sure about exactly what the infection looks like. But it seems like the virus, once again, is going to uh, track up from the uh, nose to the brain through the olfactory system. One thing that's very curious about these K18 mice is that the amount of uh, transduced or, or amount of transgenic expression of ACE2, when we measured this many years ago, was depending on mouse strain, was somewhere between uh, one to one hundredth to one to five thousandth as much in the lungs. But the virus still really tracked very well to the brain, even with this very low level of ACE2 expression. And then there's also another kind of ACE2 transgenic mice that's been described. This is a mouse ACE2 promoter and a human ACE2 in front of the human ACE2 gene. These mice have mostly lung disease and develop very mild disease with no apparent brain infection. This is described online in the Nature publication. And then the other approaches are human ACE2 knock-in mice. And if the advantage of these mice is ACE2 is expressed in the normal position in mice that uh, the mouse ACE2 promoter is active. And so the, we're, we and a lot of groups are developing these mice, but we're developing them with Jackson Labs. And uh, we hope to have, uh, we should have pups actually next week or so. And we hope to characterize the mice very shortly. Um, and we, based on previous experience, I suspect mouse adaptation will probably be required and will take somewhere between 15 and 30 passages through mouse lungs to have a fully useful virus. And then once we figured out the mouse, the mice and the mouse adapted virus, 
uh, we're going to donate these to Jackson Laboratories for distribution as well, so that they'll be whoops, so that they'll be available for the to the wider research community. And then, as I said, other groups are also developing ACE2 knock-in mice. So I don't think there's going to be a shortage of these mice. Okay, so I have a few minutes. I'll just go through some. I want to just mention some things about the immune response. So uh, just starting from the beginning, well, what do we know about protective immune responses in COVID uh, coronavirus infections? And we actually have a fair bit of information that gives hints about what might happen in COVID-19 in uh, patients. So we know that in non-SARS, non-MERS, human respiratory coronavirus infection, protection tends to be transient and waning antibody contributes to susceptibility to reinfection. So the, one of the best examples was a study in 1990 that showed 15 volunteers inoculated with one of the human cold coronaviruses 229A and the, the 10 with lower antibody titers became infected and eight developed colds. And then a year later, they were re-challenged and nine became reinfected as evidenced by virus shedding, but I don't know how much virus was shed, but none developed a cold. So this may give us a hint for what happens with uh, previously infected uh, SARS-CoV-2 patients because people who have upper respiratory tract infection may well have antibody titers. The protection may be transient, but, uh, but it may also be effective in preventing both um, lower tract disease, which of course for the individual is what we want to prevent, and then perhaps pre preventing substantial shedding. We don't really know. And there's also been a lot of uh, work with domestic uh, vaccines in animal studies with domestic and companion animals. Uh, there's these, this, the history of this vaccination has not been great. So feline coronavirus is probably the worst example. Uh, feline coronavirus is a virus that causes diarrhea in cats and then mutates to uh, cause a severe infection in some cats, feline infectious peritonitis it is caused. This is a uniformly lethal disease. And if you immunize mice with uh, constructs that express the S protein, you get variable protection and you actually get enhanced disease in some cases. And this is because macrophages uh, entry is enhanced, macrophage entry by the virus is enhanced. Uh, the, what's really unique about this feline coronavirus is it's the only one that actually infects um, macrophages preferentially. So this is the only example that I know of, a really good example of ADE, uh, antibody enhanced disease in a coronavirus infection. Another example of a disease that people wanted to control is transmissible gastroenteritis virus. And this is usually a fatal diarrhea in baby pigs. And the vaccination has had variable success, uh, mostly probably because you need IgA and uh, some of the vaccines only induced IgG, and this didn't seem to work very well. Uh, but this is no longer a problem because a, about the same time that the virus started disappearing from pig populations, a new virus arose, porcine respiratory virus, which was lacking the binding site to the uh, enteric cells. And because of this, because it only infected the uh, upper respiratory tract, these pigs did not develop severe disease, but in fact, they were immunized. So the virus of TGEV is basically not a problem in uh, pig viruses now. So this is another uh, model for how vaccination can prevent disease. In this case, it, it induced both, since it was a live virus, it induced both antibody and T cell responses. And then uh, the, in terms of the human infection, in terms of MERS and SARS, we know that from mouse studies that high levels of antibody uh, can be protected if delivered prior to infection. We know that T cells, even in the absence of antibody, afford very good protection, um, uh, but not perfect. This is just, this, these experiments were just done with a single uh, T cell epitope, and this still was 80% protection against lethality. And uh, we, again, we know that live vaccination with live attenuated vaccines is the most way, the best way to protect mice from subsequent disease. So I'm going to just very last four minutes here, five minutes go over some of the work we've done with MERS uh, coronavirus, because that's what we spent most, much of the last few years working on. So the MERS is a curious disease because it's a, really a camel disease that uh, occurs all over Africa and the Middle East and Asia. And yet cases of MERS are only found in Saudi Arabia. So this is really a mystery. And, the, and we're getting some possible explanations for this, but it's still not really well understood. And even in Saudi Arabia, 
we know that uh, the virus was there at least since 1992 and probably earlier. So you have a disease that's been in camels for at least 40 years, and yet it only crossed over to infect people in 2012. And uh, it doesn't do it anywhere except Saudi Arabia and other countries on the Arabian Peninsula. So that's besides the point of the immune response, but it's a curiosity about this infection. And when people do serology studies, for which I think have problems, it shows that in Saudi Arabia, possibly 0.15% of the total population is antibody positive. I think this number is not terribly accurate because the uh, serology test isn't very sensitive. But if you look at camel, uh, people who are in touch with camels, like shepherds or slaughterhouse workers, the percentages go up to, in this case, 2.3% and 3.6%. And so th this disease, so it, since two, unlike uh, COVID-19, this disease, though it's very severe with a 35% mortality, there's only been 2,500 cases uh, since it was first uh, identified in April of 2012. And, uh, and the rate now is about two cases a week, so not very many, but it's all in Saudi Arabia and it all seems to be not really a human disease. It seems to be crossing over from camels twice a week and then uh, somehow a sentinel person who has an underlying uh, disease, either uh, diabetes or heart disease, or is aged, they're the people who get sick. Again, a story very much like what we see with COVID-19. And antibody uh, responses tend to be transient, particularly in uh, patients who have very mild disease, subclinical disease, very similar to what we saw in those human respiratory viral, human coronavirus, human respiratory uh, coronavirus infections that cause the common cold. And there's human to human transmission, but it's not very efficient. And the thing about the antibody responses in these patients is that, that we know that antibodies are, are, are critical for protection against challenge, and we don't know the role of mucosal antibody. And this is something we need to learn for COVID-19 too, because we're not really sure how important it is in, re in protecting against the cold-like disease and the, and the subsequent deep pneumonia. Uh, and also, passive antibody is con being considered a therapy, and uh, we don't really know about what the protective dose is. And this is important, because especially for convalescent sera, we know that there's going to be a variable amount of antibody in the sera. And then, uh, finally, epidemiological studies rely on MERS-CoV antibody measurements, so we want them to be accurate. Uh, uh, the last sentence that talks about SARS patients' antibody responses were considered short-lived, not detectable after six years, but we've actually done more recent analyses with sera uh, collected from SARS, or plasma con con uh, collected from SARS uh, survivors. This is a two warning. Okay, from SARS survivors, and these uh, patients actually ended up having uh, antibodies still present. So I think that what I'm going to do is just summarize the next few slides, because I'm not going to have time for them, and basically show that what we then did is we went to our MERS survivors and looked for uh, T cell responses, and we found that T cell responses were present even in uh, patients who didn't have a long, low, or who didn't have uh, detectable antibody titers. And again, survivors who had severe disease were more likely to have antibody titers present. If they had mild disease, they were less likely to. And the longer the stay in the ICU, the sicker you were, the more antibody you had. And T cell responses in these survivors seem to correlate with fewer days in the ICU. And uh, so the, our implications certainly are that, in, at least in MERS, because the antibody testing isn't great, that we're missing many patients who were previously infected. And with that, I'm gonna stop and take any questions. So yeah, two minutes, so you can, you can keep going if you want. Oh, I had two minutes. I thought you said I had one minute before, sorry. Oh, okay. Minute, two minutes, so you have okay. a little bit more time. Yeah, so I'm just, well, I won't go back to what I just covered, but I'll just briefly mention some, uh, some thoughts about the vaccine-associated enhanced respiratory disease. So, because this is an issue that's become very important as people think about vaccines. And um, the first issue is this issue of ADE, which is really uh, increased replication in a, a cell because of antibody being present. And other than that feline virus case that I mentioned earlier with feline infectious peritonitis virus, there's really no evidence for ADE and coronavirus infections. So people are very worried about this, but so far, fortunately, this has not really been an issue at all. But it does seem to be an issue, at least in some vaccination settings, is that there's an altered pattern of immune cell infiltration after vaccination and challenge with SARS-CoV, 
and this may be relevant for SARS-CoV-2. In this case, either vaccination with uh, VRP, that same ones I discussed earlier, expressing the N protein, or vaccination with that inactivated whole virus, um, often lead to a TH2 type infiltration or eosinophilia. This is in mice, uh, but there's no change in clinical disease that's worsened by this vaccination. And the, the other illustration that occurs is of this kind of problem is in the CACs, where there's a study published uh, um, that showed that there was increased inflammatory infiltration in lungs after, infiltra uh, after immunization with a vaccine virus expressing the S protein. Or if you took uh, antibodies from these uh, monkeys and put them into new monkeys, then affected with SARS-CoV, you saw a change in the inflammatory infiltrate. The one from a wound healing M2 to a pro-inflammatory type macrophages and mediators such as IL-8 and CCL2 were uh, upregulated in expression. Uh, this, this study is curious because the macaques weren't, didn't develop much disease before or after immunization. So this was all a histological change. And this is really, an, this study is uh, quoted often because it, we worry about it for human vaccination and it's, and it's uncertain, it's really uncertain what it means because macaques did not get worse disease. Uh, they weren't more or less protected because they were never developing disease much anyway. And I should say I'm an author on this paper, but I'm confused by it, even though I'm an author by it, on it. Mm -hmm. so with that, I will stop. And now I think my two minutes are up. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Stanley. Uh, I think we have time. We have a lot of questions. We can only take three of them. Uh, so Rebecca, uh, Hugh. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, great. Hi, I'm Rebecca Huff. I'm a pediatric critical care physician over at our Children's Hospital at Columbia and also a lung biologist working with Jahar Bhattacharya. Um, thanks for your great talk. Um, I saw that you um, you see that the ACE2 mice uh, when challenged with the virus uh, lose weight and have cellular infiltration. But I was wondering if you had any evidence that there's pulmonary edema, such as uh, protein accumulation in bronchoalveolar lavage or wet to dry ratio increase, uh, extracellular lung water, um, extra vascular lung water, anything else like that? Yeah, it's a good question. So edema in these mice models is always consistent with more severe disease. We see some mice that have only edema, not very many perivascular infiltrates or peribronchial infiltrates, and they do poorly. And in these mice, we saw some edema, not a huge amount. If we'd seen a huge amount, we would have been surprised because these mice are recovering, even though they lose weight uh, and they have some ruffled fur and other signs of illness, they're still recovering. So yes, we saw some edema, and yes, I think edema is a really important marker for severe disease. Thanks so much. Great. Ira? Right, so in the BAL paper, um, it looks like they had a stock of uh, 2019. Hello? In the, now you can hear me, I'm sorry. Uh, in, in the BAL paper, they used a 2019 stock of COVID-2 mice. Uh, you had mentioned that you need to pass the virus uh, through the mice, I believe, in order to get a uh, potent strain. Can you explain uh, exactly what needs to be done in order to get pathology in these mouth mo models in terms of the virus to be used? Yeah, so it's, this is, so, what, so we have experience both from SARS that was done by Ralph Barrick and Countess Subaru and uh, from uh, MERS, which we did and Ralph's lab did independently. And basically, these mice, the, for the knock-in mice, they don't develop much disease. And so, but they did infect the lungs because that's the first key thing. You have to be able to get a foothold in the lungs. And then if you passage it for some number of passages, now you get um, uh, a virus that's more virulent. And as I said, you can, you, the, the number of mutations required is very limited. If, if you passage it 10 times, you'll get 10, 10 different sets of mutations, but they all seem to be in the same proteins surface glycoprotein, nucleocapsid, transmembrane, and a few of the non-structural proteins in the five prime end of the genome. Um, but the, another key thing is, so it not only has to get a foothold, but it can't be one of these, it can't be a transgenic mice that gets brain disease, because then you never get a chance for uh, the system to really work, because mice die too quickly from the brain disease. So that's what you need to do to have it be successful. Thank you. Um, one last question from uh, Yun Yue Wang. Yeah, hi. Actually, this is Shan here. Um, the, I have uh, two questions. Uh, one is that uh, um, does in the mouse, the ACE1 expression is like in the humans that is enriching endocytic cells, 
or whether the transgenic model uh, would mimic this endocytic cell expression of ACE2. Yeah, so I don't think in the um, I don't think in the transgenic mice you get. Well, I don't really know. No, I don't really know. Uh, I know in our adenovirus system we we don't see endothelial cell infection, but I don't know in the uh, transgenic or the uh, knock in or the um, knock in mice for sure because we don't have those yet. Whether uh, ACE2 is expressed in endothelial cells clearly an important question because that seems to be involved in the pathogenesis, uh, both of the child Kawasaki-like disease and uh, some of the, some of the adults who die from the infection. So, but I don't know the answer to that.